In this series of videos, we're going to focus on answering questions of how much in chemical reactions. How much of two substances combine with each other to form some amount of product, or how much product should I expect given a certain amount of starting materials. We'll also talk about how to classify chemical reactions to begin to get a feel for the different types of chemical reactions that you'll encounter throughout your study of chemistry. So just as a general outline, we're going to begin with really the anatomy of a chemical equation, which is a representation of a chemical reaction in textual form and talk about writing and balancing chemical equations. Then we're going to move into classifying chemical reactions, focusing on three fairly broad and important types of chemical reactions, precipitations and dissolutions, acid-base reactions, and oxidation reduction or redox processes. Then we're going to really dig into the quantitative side of answering these how much questions, looking at reaction stoichiometry and how to think about mass and mole relationships between species involved in a chemical reaction. And finally, we're going to talk about reaction yields. We can use stoichiometry to predict how much product we expect to see in a chemical reaction, and yields give us a sense of that, as well as a sense of how well we did relative to the theoretical when we run an actual reaction and get a mass out of it. So let's begin with chemical equations. In a chemical reaction, atoms gain or lose electrons and bonds are broken or formed. And we represent that in terms of a chemical equation by writing the formulas of the reactants and products and listing numbers to indicate how they combine and phase designators to indicate the state of matter of, the, of each substance in the reaction. And so an example is shown for us here. The identities of the species, the atoms or molecules or ions involved, are listed using their chemical formulas. Here it's CH4, O2, CO2, and H2O. We also list the number of molecules that combine in a single event or occurrence of the reaction, typically to the left of the formula. If you don't see a number, of course, that implies one of that molecule is involved. Here we have a one to two to one to two ratio of uh, reactants and products going on in this reaction. And finally, the phases or the states of matter of the molecules are also typically shown. They're not shown here, but let's draw them in. This is a reaction between two gases to form two gaseous products, and we use a G in parentheses, as we'll see in more detail in a second, to represent the state of each as gaseous uh, following the formula. So on the slide, we see the chemical equation as well as a representation of the reaction using atomic or molecular level um, models of the reactants. CH4 with one carbon and four hydrogens, two oxygen molecules, going to CO2 and two molecules of water, H2O. The number of a particular type of molecule that combines in a chemical reaction is called its stoichiometric coefficient. And this is that number that shows up before the chemical formula in the balanced chemical equation. And so we could say it's the number of particles of that species be it an atom molecule or ion, that is consumed or produced in a single reaction event, a single occurrence of the reaction. Now, these are relative numbers that can be applied at any scale. We can scale up all the stoichiometric coefficients to still really depict the same essential chemical reaction. For example, if we scaled this up to 2 to 4 to 2 to 4, we'd still be really depicting the same chemical reaction, just at a different scale. And that's important to understand that the balanced chemical equation applies both at the level of a single molecule and at the level of a mole and at any scale in between. So we can talk about one molecule of CH4 reacting with two molecules of O2, one dozen molecules of CH4 reacting with two dozen molecules of O2, so on and so forth. And at the macroscopic scale, we tend to talk about combinations in units of moles, one mole of CH4 reacting with two moles of O2 to form one mole of CO2 and, one, and two moles of H2O, for example, in this reaction. So the stoichiometric coefficient, you can think of it almost as a ratio with reaction events, one CH4 for every reaction event. And we can scale up and down these coefficients as needed to really fit the situation. And we'll use the molecular and molar levels almost interchangeably, moving rather fluidly between the submicroscopic and the macroscopic levels of chemistry. Let's apply our understanding of stoichiometric coefficients to an example now to predict the composition of a product mixture. So this is our reaction of methane, CH4, and O2 that we've been working with previously. 
And there's a picture of the reactants before reaction has occurred here on the left-hand side. And if we just count the numbers of molecules involved, we see that there are three CH4 molecules and there are six O2 molecules in the reaction mixture before the reaction has taken place. And the question is, what is the composition of the mixture at the end of the reaction, after the reaction has run its course, as I like to say? Well, based on this ratio of combination, this one to two ratio, we can scale up this ratio to three to six to understand that three molecules of CH4 will combine with six molecules of O2 to form three molecules of CO2 and six molecules of H2O. And this essentially gives us the answer, right? We've got three molecules of CO2, and we can represent those using three molecular level drawings of the CO2 molecule like this. And we have six molecules of H2O, and again, we can represent those six H2Os as six molecular structures for H2O. So in essence, what we did here is we looked at the scale we were working with, three to six, and saw how that mapped onto the coefficients in our balanced chemical equation, one to two, realizing that we could scale this up to understand what the outcome would be if we started with not one and two molecules of CH4 and O2, but three and six instead. My hope is that you have some experience balancing chemical equations from your high school chemistry courses. This is really a foundational skill for success in chemistry, being able to both balance a chemical equation given reactants and products and verify that a given equation is balanced. You'll do the verification, honestly, as much if not more than balancing an equation outright. And the idea of a balanced equation is that all of the atoms on the reactant side are accounted for in the products. All of the elements are balanced on both sides of the equation. So in the chemical equation we've been working with, for example, we have one carbon in CH4 on the reactant side and one carbon in CO2 on the product side. So carbon is balanced, one on each side. When it comes to hydrogen, we've got four in methane on the left-hand side and two times two, or four total, on the product side in the two waters. And so hydrogen is balanced as well. And finally, for oxygen, we have four oxygen atoms on the left-hand side, a total of four oxygen atoms, two in the CO2 and two in the two water molecules on the right-hand side, and so oxygen is balanced as well in this chemical equation. Occasionally, you'll see the phase or the state of matter of the reactants and products left out of chemical equations. I like to include them, though, to help develop a mental image of how the reaction works, both at the macroscopic scale in terms of, you know, what am I looking at, a solid, liquid, or gas, and a submicroscopic scale. What do the molecules or atoms look like when they combine at the molecular level? State is indicated using a letter or letters in parentheses following the formula. And there are four states that we'll primarily be concerned with in this course, solid, liquid, and gas, the standard states of matter, and then dissolved in water or aqueous. And that's represented using AQ in parentheses. So you might see, for example, CO2 gas represented this way liquid water, looking like this, solid magnesium metal, looking like this, and, and the state gives us an indication of what the substance looks like, which is helpful for visualization. Now, of course, there's the arrow in the middle that separates the reactants and products. Any special conditions required for the reaction to proceed are listed above and sometimes below the arrow. So for example, the delta symbol indicates that we have to heat the reactants in order to get the reaction to go. Reflux is a special type of heating at the boiling point of the solvent that dissolves all the reactants. You'll also see specific pressures, temperatures, reaction times, etc., above or below reaction arrows from time to time. On this slide, we're taking a look at some specific chemical equations involving ions. And ions are a bit interesting in chemical equations in that in actual physical fact, when dissolved in water, ions separate and form their own really discrete solvated ionic species. However, with chemical equations, just to keep things compact, we often write ionic compounds using their full chemical formula based on the formula unit, even when they're dissolved in water and the ions have dissociated. A molecular equation depicts ionic compounds in this associated form. It's a little bit misleading physically, but it's compact, which is the reason we do it. So here, for example, we're writing aqueous calcium chloride reacts with two silver nitrates, and everything's dissolved in water, 
to form one calcium nitrate and two solid silver chlorides. So uh, we go from two aqueous species to an aqueous and a solid species in this, in this reaction. And although the ions are dissociated in physical fact, we're writing everything as associated just to keep things a little bit more concise. The complete ionic equation respects this idea that the dissolved ions are dissociated and are distinct aqueous species, and it writes them as such. So in the complete ionic equation, we're writing Ca2 plus and Cl minus as separate species taking care to maintain balance, right? That two CLs in the CaCl2 reactant correspond to two Cl minus ions after that compound has dissolved in water. And so the overall chemical equation is still balanced and I encourage you to check this. It's just, we've separated out all the aqueous ionic compounds into their component ions with positive or negative charges. One thing we'll notice about the complete ionic equation is that it has a number of ions in common on both sides. For example, NO3- appears both on the product side and on the reactant side. And actually, in fact, I missed a coefficient here. Um, there should be a coefficient of two in front of the NO3- here. Those two ions are exactly the same in the reactant and product side, so it looks like absolutely nothing has happened. Uh, between those two ions. Similarly with calcium 2 plus. Calcium 2 plus appears on the reactant side and on the product side. What this means is that these ions aren't really doing anything in the course of the reaction, right? So we can think about removing them without really changing the essence of the chemical process that's going on. These ions that are in the chemical reaction but don't change chemically are called spectator ions. And the net ionic equation omits spectator ions or leaves them out. Notice that once we've removed the calcium 2 plus and NO3 minus ions, we're left with just two Cl minus ions plus two silver plus ions gives two solid silver chloride, showing that the essence of the chemical change in this process is really the combination of two aqueous ions to form a solid ionic product. We commonly need to take a textual description of a reaction and translate it into a chemical equation form. This makes it very easy to apply stoichiometry and really think about the reaction at the molecular level. It's much harder to do so when you're looking at a block of text. And in this example problem, we'll work through how to do this for a reaction involving some ions. When carbon dioxide is dissolved in an aqueous solution of sodium hydroxide, the mixture reacts to yield aqueous sodium carbonate and liquid water. And our goal here is to take that sentence and turn it into molecular, complete ionic, and net ionic equations with the states of matter of all species involved listed as well. So let's start with the molecular equation. And the first step here is really to translate each chemical name into a chemical formula. That's a nomenclature task, right? So if, that, if you're struggling with that to solve this problem, go back and review our nomenclature materials in a previous lesson. Carbon dioxide is CO2. That reacts with sodium hydroxide, which is NaOH, to form sodium carbonate, which is Na2CO3, and water. To balance this equation, we need two NaOHs for every one CO2, and we can just quickly check that this is balanced. We've got four oxygens, two and two, on the left-hand side, and four oxygens on the right-hand side. We have one carbon on the left-hand side and one carbon on the right-hand side, two sodiums on the left-hand side and two sodiums on the right-hand side, and two hydrogens on the left and two hydrogens on the right. So everything's balanced. We're good to go. In terms of phases or states of matter, all I'm doing is looking at the state listed in the text and translating it into a designator in parentheses. So aqueous, a Q in parentheses, and the liquid water is represented using kind of a script L inside parentheses there. Now, how do we translate this molecular equation into a complete ionic equation? Well, the key is to recognize and identify the ionic compounds. What are the ionic compounds in this reaction? Well, CO2 contains nonmetals only, so it's a covalent or molecular compound. NaOH contains a metal, sodium, together with Non, a non-metal ion hydroxide, so it's Na plus OH minus, that's an ionic compound. Likewise, sodium carbonate contains the sodium plus cation together with the carbonate polyatomic anion. To generate the complete ionic equation, now that we've identified these ionic compounds, 
we split them off into their component ions and depict each as an aqueous species. And by the way, liquid water, water of course containing only non-metal atoms, that's a molecular or covalent compound as well, so no need to worry about that for the complete ionic equation. We include the CO2 and the water just as they were in the molecular equation, but split out the ions with sodium plus, two of them, because of the two equivalents of sodium hydroxide, two hydroxide ions, two sodium ions on the right, Na2 gives two Na pluses, and then the carbonate anion on the right as well. So this is the complete ionic equation. How do we go from the complete ionic equation to the net ionic equation? Well, we look at both sides of the complete ionic equation and look for ions that are spectators, that do nothing in the transformation from reactants to products. And here, the sodium cations are very clearly spectator ions. They're not really doing anything, right? Two Na pluses on the reactant side, two Na pluses on the product side. Everything else does appear to undergo chemical change, so sodium plus is the only spectator ion here. To write the, chemical, uh, the net ionic chemical equation, once we've identified those spectators, we just leave them out and rewrite the complete ionic equation. So CO2 uh, aqueous, this should say aqueous, not gas, um, reacts with aqueous hydroxide, two equivalents. Those stoichiometric coefficients follow us around through all of, the, all of these processes, and that's going to give CO3 2 minus the carbonate anion and H2O. And let's just double check that this is still balanced. So three oxygens, I'm sorry, four oxygens, two here and two here, four oxygens on the product side, one carbon on, the, on each side, and then two hydrogens over here and two hydrogens there. So everything's balanced and we are good to go.